we are missing a very important um, student in the class who I cannot start, you know. There is the devil. <laughs> Let's see a few announcements. Uh, the, uh, there will be no recitation on Friday, uh, out of exhaustion, you know, and collecting your homework. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, I'm thinking actually. So, how about if we have a lecture on Friday uh, to account for the lecture just after Thanksgiving? I'm going to be back between two international trips for a day only. And so, uh, if we can this Friday account for that lecture as well, then uh, you will have it uh, off from uh, the week before Thanksgiving. Okay, so you can work on your project. So let's uh, have a lecture on Friday. Uh, there is a homework due next next uh, Monday. It's not a very difficult homework, but has a lots of simple things that require lots of attention and lots of time. So if you plan to finish it up starting. Uh, Sunday night, you know, it will not work, you know, even if you work the whole night and you sleep in your desk, okay? Um, so, if there is anything in the problems that you think is not in the slides, uh, bring it to my attention, I will let that information, but I think everything is there, okay? So, I believe one of the problems uh, is uh, reproducing the results that the Kalman filter does. So I thought, uh, just to finish sequence of Monte Carlo today, uh, to finish the lectures in sequence of Monte Carlo today, I thought we should discuss a little bit uh, about uh, uh, these linear Gaussian models, in particular conditional linear Gaussian models. Okay? So I have um, um, the tasks today will be, I'm going to start with uh, sequence of Monte Carlo for conditional linear Gaussian models. So we're going to go back to dynamical systems. Uh, I'm going to, uh, believe it or not, in 10 minutes, 5 minutes, I'm going to derive the Kalman filter equations, right? Uh, so you don't need to take a class just for Kalman filtering, okay? Uh, and um, I'm going to bypass uh, some interesting topics on uh, time series, uh, partially observed linear Gaussian models, uh, these probit models. Uh, so there are examples basically in the slides, but there are significant examples in the little stream machine learning. So I'm going to bypass those so you guys can read them. And then I'm going to go back to the slides from uh, Monday uh, to cover um, sequence of Monte Carlo for smoothing problems. All right? Uh, you will see what smoothing means. And also uh, to briefly discuss how you do sequential Monte Carlo when there are known parameters in your uh, problem that you need to compute simultaneously with the computation of the state. So you have some parameters that don't change with time, they're static, and you still want to compute the state. So this is basically the real problem because in any dynamical system you don't really know what drives the dynamics. Uh, so let's say you can postulate some equation but has a lot of unknown parameters. So how do you compute those? at the same time as the unknown state. So I'm going to do all of this, um, hopefully, um, so that you are aware that this information is in the slides and you can read about it. OK. So um, let, let me see. Um, so we're going to let me jump to, um, to uh, the situation where um, uh, karma filtering will come to be uh, a useful uh, algorithm. Is there anybody in the room, I'm just out of curiosity, who never heard of Kalman filtering or what it does and what it is or, you know, one, okay. Uh, there's nothing bad to say, I never heard of Kalman filtering, all right. Okay. You mean I mentioned it already before? All right, okay. All right. Uh, so, um, it is obviously an exact solution to certain linear Gaussian dynamical models, okay? So uh, uh, it's a, uh, if nothing else, is one of the top algorithms of the 20th century. Um, I mean, we're talking about not 
10,000 citations, who knows? Uh, you search the word Kalman, you know, filtering, uh, you may find uh, a few million or a billion, I don't know, references to it, okay? So you need to know, uh, and in particular, you need to know because in the homework problem, I gave you a linear problem where you can, uh, you need to compare your results with Kalman filtering. So let me, I mean, very rapidly, there is really, it's, it's very simple, I'm gonna try to do it in an unsophisticated manner so we can uh, review of, uh, uh, the results um, for dynamical systems. So I am uh, considering what these two equations as my dynamical system. X is the unknown state. Uh, it evolves with this equation here. Uh, the observations are Y and uh, uh, you notice they are linear in, um, in uh, the state. And um, uh, this uh, noise, uh, V and W here are Gaussian, okay? So uh, remember A, B, C, and D. And uh, I put a subscript there to indicate that um, these matrices basically can change with time, right? So, you know, they can uh, evolve. And in particular, this will be useful when you have, um, and I think we already did an example of this uh, without mentioning maybe too much of Kalman filtering. We did some examples with dynamical systems where we forced the equations to take this form by doing linearization. So you can have, for example, nonlinear dynamics. If you linearize them at every step, you can write them in this form. And the same thing about the observations. Okay? And that leads sort of to uh, extensions of the classical uh, Kalman equations. So you can do lots of uh, fancy things. Uh, but that's our system. So. Um, uh, the objective is basically to compute at uh, time n, let's say, uh, the posterior distribution of the whole state, but I'm going to concentrate here on xn given y1 to n. That's our standard problem that we address with sequential Monte Carlo. All right. So the carbon filtering is the exact solution to the problem uh, where all the distributions are Gaussian. Uh, the dynamics and observation equations are linear uh, in the state. And the original references in deriving an analytical solution were based on the fact, you know, they were based on the minimization of the, of the posterior estimation er error um, for the state. But what I'm going to do now, I'm going to give you sort of a, uh, a more sort of algebraic derivation, right? There is, uh, we don't really want to recover history. We just need to see the fundamental equations so you guys can do a comparison with uh, uh, sequence and Monte Carlo. So this is the problem, okay? Uh, will you agree with me? I can write this in a probability form as, as because you know, we, this is how we started uh, for our dynamical system. We had uh, an evolution equation for the state and we had an observation equation. So using this two, uh, the mean is, um, uh, Okay, I see here xn, xn minus 1, here we have n plus 1n, it's okay. So the mean is an xn, and the variance is b, b, b transpose. The same thing about the observation equation, okay? So our target is this, uh, using these two equations. I, um, I don't have to tell you uh, that all of the distributions of interest will come to be Gaussians, okay? And that's what makes this uh, uh, an easy problem. So, uh, in particular, I'm not going to go through the details there. In particular, the target distribution of xn, given all my data up to time n, uh, is a Gaussian. And I'm going to denote the mean and the variance with the, not the subscript notation that you see here. And the two n's, basically, you are looking at the state in n, given all the data up to time n. So that's why you see nn and nn. Okay? So remember when you see. Uh, the mean and the uh, this covariance sigma with subscripts and n, they refer to this filtering distribution, right? This is what we call a filtering distribution of xn given all the data to time n. So we're going to have to come up with some recursive way to compute this mean and the variance, um, okay, uh, using our a, b, and c, and d matrices that we had before. Now, I remind you, and we did the same thing with sequential Monte Carlo, the first thing that you need to do in a derivation is to derive a state using the data up to previous time step. 
So this is the prediction of the state Xn if you know the data from 1 to n minus 1. Uh, again, uh, if you go back on the sequential Monte Carlo methods, that's what uh, we did. So I'm going to repeat this calculation here. Uh, so we want this posterior of Xn given the data up to n minus 1. Uh, the state Xn is, of course, we are interested in recursive equations, right? So Xn is a n x n minus 1 plus b n times that uh, uh, Gaussian noise v n. Uh, so the mean of this, I mean, obviously this is a Gaussian because this is Gaussian, this is Gaussian to start with. So the mean is uh, the mean of x n minus 1 given the data from 1 to n minus 1. And m according to my notation, this is mu with subscripts n minus 1, n minus 1. You agree? Right? So basically, I'm trying to uh, compute the mean uh, of this distribution and the variance, right? So uh, Xn is written like that. So if I want the mean, it should be the mean, it would be the matrix A times the mean of Xn minus 1 uh, given my data. And recursively, I call this mu n minus 1, n minus 1. That's the notation I introduced before. You remember? You remember I started and I said I'm going to call this mu n n, sigma n n. So obviously that could be mu n minus 1 n minus 1, which is nice. All right? Recursively, I will be able to uh, recycle these results. Uh, similarly, OK, the mean of this is 0. Uh, if you need the variance of uh, this distribution, uh, the covariance would be you substitute x n equal uh, a x n minus 1 plus b times v. Um, and uh, if you do the algebra, if you remember how you can, if you have a linear uh, a times x, the covariance of this is a transpose times the covariance of x times, I'm sorry, a times the covariance of x times a transpose. And uh, this is a, 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 a normal Gaussian, so the covariance is b, b transpose. So the uh, covariance comes to be uh, this interesting looking equation, right? Nothing to remember. Uh, at all, you know, you just need to know what it is and how to use it. So effectively, this predictive distribution comes to be Gaussian that has this mean and it has this covariance, all right? Uh, and uh, it is number one s sort of step in our calculation, okay? Uh, remember, the objective is to derive recursively this, all right? This is the... Um, filtering distribution of Xn given all the data to time n, and I want to derive this mean and variance in terms of the corresponding variables at n minus 1. Uh, so here, this is not directly useful, but you will see why I'm starting with this, uh, with this step. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to introduce my observation at time n as well. Uh, the equation, if you remember, it was C times x plus d times w. And, uh, I am, uh, I am going to try to actually do computations for the joint distribution of Xn and Yn given all my previous data. And you remember just a few seconds ago in the previous slide, I gave you the calculation of the probability of Xn given my, uh, this is the one step ahead uh, state given all the previous data. So now I'm going to augment that to incorporate Yn. And you know why I want to do this? Because if I compute this distribution, how can I go back from there and compute this distribution? So look at this. This is what we want. If I compute this distribution, can I find the filtering distribution of Xn given all my data to time n? How can I, from here, derive the probability of Xn given all of my data? What type of calculation I will need to do after to do that? If I give you this and I tell you it's a Gaussian, what do I need to do to derive the distribution of Xn given Yn and Y1 to n minus 1? What's the buzzword? What do I need? I have here the joint distribution of Xn, Yn given the data Yn to n minus 1. What will I need to do once I know this? to compute the probability of Xn given Yn and Yn 1 to n minus 1. Nick, I cannot hear you. 
What do I need? They are waiting for you. You're on the tape now. So what do I need from that? If I know this, and it comes to be, it's a, it comes to be a Gaussian, right? And it is the John Gaussian of Xn and Yn. What calculation will I need to do to derive the probability of Xn given uh, Y from 1 to N? No, we don't need to complete the square. We complete the square years ago. We are way past completing the square. The completing the square is for the, uh, you know, the first class, second class. After that, you already have completed the square. All right? So, so what is the calculation eventually you need to do from this to derive xn given those two? No division, no division. Say it again. Bayesian. Come on, guys. We will need the conditional then of x given yn, right, and yn, n minus 1, no? The conditional. And we know how to find the conditional of a Gaussian, right? And of course, yes, there is a completing the square and uh, putting some parentheses here and there and other nice things. But at the end of the day, if we know this is Gaussian, then by taking the conditional of x given y, we will form the probability of xn given all of the data to time n. Okay? So, uh, what, uh, using this, we already have seen that xn given this data is a Gaussian. So now what we need to do is we need to produce the probability of yn given the data up to n minus 1. So the probability of the next observation given the data up to n minus 1. And of course, we have to compute the joint, uh, the, the covariance of xn and yn given the data up to n minus 1. And the calculations are basically uh, straightforward. So what I do, for example, if you want to compute this, uh, this is your uh, observation equation. You plug it in there. And so when uh, you take the mean, the mean will be basically cn times uh, what's the mean of xn given the data up to uh, n minus 1? Our notation, you remember from the slide before? Mu n, n minus 1. You remember the notation for this? The mean is mu n, n minus 1. Okay? And uh, similarly, if you want the covariance of this, you plug it in. This is what you get. And of course, you are going to have to find the covariance of xn and yn. Uh, and uh, when you do all of this, this is what you get. The joint distribution of xn and yn, given all the data up to time n minus 1, is that nice Gaussian that you see up there, where every single term can be computed sort of recursively from the previous calculations. And now, to finish the whole story and compute the filtering distribution, which the probability of xn given all the data up to time n, we will have to use these formulas for the conditional distribution of a joint Gaussian. You remember that? By completing the square, yes, but you know, once you grow, you know, you don't say uh, completing the square, you do it once, twice, you convince yourself that you know how to complete the square, and then you start completing the cube after that. All right? You're advancing. Okay, so this is a formula, you remember I told you once, uh, you will have to use this uh, uh, every other day when you play with Gaussians. So uh, if you take this result here for this joint Gaussian, right, and you form the conditional effects given yn, and of course given yn to n minus 1, this is what you get, which is the final result. So the probability of xn given all my data of time n has this Gaussian, has this nice mean, all right? Um, and uh, uh, has this nice covariance, all right? And this matrix S10 here is what you see here. So really, we're first driving the karma filter. There is nothing there. That's it. Done. All right? So you can think, uh, if you were doing this today, uh, you have been very famous, but, you know, uh, sometimes simple things are the most important in... Uh, science and engineering, and the camera filtering is one of these trivial things that has applications everywhere. Everywhere. You just mentioned to me any problem, uh, and you will see the relevance of uh, camera filtering. Okay? So, remember this uh, comes from the 
uh, one step ahead uh, prediction of the state. That's why it has indices n, n minus 1. Uh, and um, uh, this is similarly the covariance for this predicted distribution. And so let me just summarize all the equations. You want to compute this, okay? So you start with some um, uh, initial distribution for the state, all right, with some mean and variance, let's say. Uh, you do the prediction in one step ahead, so you have to uh, compute this mu n, n minus 1, sigma n, n minus 1, given by these formulas. So the idea here is we already have computed this at step n minus 1, right? We're going to do this recursively. So here we compute it at 0. Let's say we already have computed at n minus 1. So this mu and this sigma are already computed from the previous time step. So you compute this and you compute that. And then the update formulas are what is given here. So the new filtering distribution has this mean and this covariance, and you're done. OK? And again, you don't need to uh, remember these formulas, uh, but you need to know what they are. So actually, for your homework, even though you can call the statistical library, let's say, uh, from uh, MATLAB, uh, may I recommend that you actually program this? Basically, you write, you know, it will be a few lines of a code, and it will be your own Kalman filtering sort of uh, implementation in a few lines uh, for computing this uh, 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 filtering distribution. Okay. So, done with the, Gaussian, with the linear Gaussian model, so I want to go to an application of Sequenza Monte Carlo, where somehow it can come up that these uh, uh, Carlo filtering equations can be very handy. And uh, it's sad that we don't have anybody in the audience who works on, uh, I don't know, in robotics or in um, 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 tracking problems, you know, because this is where these ideas are used extensively, okay? So, uh, but actually, so I'm going to give you what's a conditional linear Gaussian model, but let me just tell you, you can take a fluid mechanics problem with dynamics, you know, and when you integrate the equations, you can make the equations basically to look similarly to a, a conditional linear Gaussian model. So you can write a lot of different things in this form. So here is the definition of the problem. Conditional linear Gaussian model. So uh, if you remember, we had uh, in uh, our classical sequence of Monte Carlo, we had a state, we call it x. Now I have two unknown state variables, uh, one that is xn and another one that is zn. Right, so I have two unknown state variables, xn and zn, okay? And so my observation equation is similar to what I had before. The evolution of z is similar to what we considered before for what we call x. But you notice now, these matrices a, b, c, d are, are uh, all functions of the other state variable xn. And let's take that xn evolves uh, through this dynamic uh, model that you see uh, written in this bullet here. Okay? Uh, can you tell me why this is called conditionally linear Gaussian model? The word conditionally refers to what now? Conditional on x, right? So in other words, if somehow we knew what x is, this is a linear Gaussian model. And what is the solution, the exact solution to a linear Gaussian model? The Kalman filter. Right? And just to give you some examples, right? I'm not going to have time to discuss this, but you can imagine if XN is uh, the motion of uh, an airplane or a missile, right? And it's a discrete variable. XN equal 1 can be a smooth motion. Uh, XN equal 0 can be, you know, having some discontinuity, crashing down or reversing. So you can have different dynamics, and XN defines to what mode of these dynamics you are, okay? But if you knew XN, which you don't, if you knew XN, uh, then this is a linear Gaussian model. So you need sort of a technique to take advantage of the carbon filter. I mean, of course, you know what you can do is you can say, big deal, my new state is XN, ZN, and put this equation in the same form like that. And then it fits like a sequential Monte Carlo algorithm. And you can work in that enhanced space, use the same equations, and you will get the right solution. But you're not going to be taking advantage of this structure of this model 
that basically screams for the fact that the effect sign is known, then this is uh, a problem with an analytical solution. So we need to take advantage of that. Uh, so I mentioned XN can be discrete. Uh, the way that I wrote it here is uh, continuous. I think somewhere in the slides, I consider both cases of XN being discrete, a random variable, uh, a known state, and also continuous. OK. Um, so we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this. Uh, we don't have too much time. So uh, this is what we want to compute, OK? X is an unknown state, Z is an unknown state, and, and obviously the main objective in sequential Monte Carlo is to compute these probabilities of the uh, state from 1 to n, given all the data up to 1 to n. So the way I'm going to write this uh, probability to identify what the problem is, is as P of Z given Y and X, right? You see this P of Z given Y of X times P of X given Y. We agree? Nothing else but the product rule. Now, I want you to tell me, can we compute analytically P of Z given X and Y? That's the Kalma filter equations. Done. All right? So the objective in uh, working with these conditional dynamic linear models is really to compute uh, P of X given Y. OK? This is what we need to compute, P of X given Y. If somehow we can compute P of X given Y, uh, then because this is uh, known analytically, we are done with uh, uh, this equation. Okay? All right. Um, so uh, I remind you again, uh, we have seen this 100 times, and I would like to hear one of you in your projects using sequence of Monte Carlo and using the same notation uh, to at least uh, Tell me that you learned something on Sequencia Monte Carlo, right? So our objective is P of X from 1 to N given Y from 1 to N. Please do not get confused. Remember before when we were doing Sequencia Monte Carlo, this was our target distribution. But now we have a state that is X and Z. But as I said before, right, as I said before, this is known analytically, so when I say P of X given Y, it's not the same calculation precisely that we did uh, with sequential Monte Carlo. Because here there is a Z2, all right? But this is known, so here what we want to compute is P of X given Y. So what is going to be different from uh, our earlier developments in sequential Monte Carlo will be that the governing equations are different, but basically still we need this filtering distribution of P of X given Y. All right, so um, in the classical uh, way for, uh, um, actually, let me see. I'm going to save uh, space. So let me, uh, I'm going to go directly on this. What happened to the algorithm? OK, so uh, we're going to try to apply uh, the standard uh, sequential Monte Carlo algorithm to calculate this filtering distribution of X given Y. But then we're also going to try to account uh, for the particulars of this conditional Gaussian linear system. So I remind you the algorithm, um, which is cut and paste from before. Uh, we're, you know, uh, we're going to uh, generate a sample from a proposal distribution sequentially. So this will be from a proposal distribution of Xn given uh, all my previous uh, states from 1 to n minus 1 for each particle i. Uh, I'm going to compute the incremental weight, and the incremental weight is the target distribution at time n divided by the target distribution at n minus 1 times this proposal distribution. And remind me, what is pi here? Or in some notation we use, we call it gamma. Uh, what is pi in this problem? What is our target? You remember this? It's really the unnormalized part of our target distribution. So what is this uh, pi there? What is pi of n in this problem? Is the joint distribution of? Come on. Well, here I actually, that's why I said I should put a gamma. OK? So this is our target distribution, right? It is the probability of x1 to n uh, given y1 to n. 
uh, but really uh, I would be happy if we just use the anormalized part of that, which is the joint distribution of x1 to n, comma y1 to n, okay? So uh, this is our standard uh, algorithm for uh, including resampling, right, using sequential Monte Carlo, but obviously doing this calculation, we have not accounted for anything whatsoever from the particulars of this condition of Gaussian linear uh, model in computing um, uh, the distribution of the X states given uh, the data Y. So we need to bring that in the picture. So I remind you a few things before I do the calculations. Um, I am writing this uh, target distribution as Pn of all the states up to n minus 1 times the conditional of Xn given Xn n minus 1, all right? Uh, and uh, what is the optimal? So this part of the incremental weight does not depend on Xn, okay? So the optimal distribution of uh, Xn the, this proposal distribution, the optimal is the one that is, uh, makes this uh, constant equal to 1, so this is the optimal distribution. You remember that? Okay? All right. So, um, let me see, uh, I'm going to, so, I'm going to put the particulars now, this is what we want to compute. I'm going to bring Y in the picture, so I condition Y explicitly, and I'm going to write uh, the joint probability distribution. You notice here, I do have the anormalized part, okay? So um, basically, uh, my notation has not been very rigorous, okay? But, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, we, we, hopefully we understand what's going on here. So this is our target distribution at 10. Uh, anormalized, this is our target distribution at 10 minus 1. This is the proposal distribution. And, um, um, you know, this, you can write it as the target distribution at n minus 1 times uh, the condition of yn given the previous data and all the states up to n times uh, f of xn given xn minus 1. I'm not really doing anything here but using the dynamical model. So uh, does it look obvious to you that this is equal to this? I mean, I use basically the product rule here. Can I do that? Can I write this equal to this? You remember, for, I mean, this is, whole thing is factorizing, and you know, uh, uh, and we compute this hierarchically, so this is the joint distribution up to n minus 1, and then you're going to have uh, xn and yn left there, so we're going to have the condition of yn given um, the uh, data up to n minus 1 and the states up to n, and then the condition of x n uh, given x n minus 1, basically. Okay? So, this term and this term cancel out, and we get something that looks like that, which is basically the very general form we use for uh, sequential Monte Carlo in uh, state space models. Okay? This is what we did uh, before. So there is nothing particular, again, to conditional linear Gaussian models. Uh, so again, the algorithm uh, using the particular dynamics here uh, looks like that. OK? Can you give me some ideas when we did uh, um, state space models? What were the two uh, popular choices we used? What was the easiest choice we used for proposal distribution? which actually you are going to have to do in the homework. So what was the, yeah, there were many choices, including the optimal, that I referred to it a few slides ago. Uh, what was the most trivial way to sample, uh, what is the choice for Q? Huh? You remember, uh, can I sample from um, uh, here? Uh, there is information coming from all the data points, including up to time n. Can I sample from the dynamical models without any uh, accounting at all for the observations? You remember the uh, bootstrap approximation that we did? All right. So yes, we can take, uh, you know, we can sample from that. And then the only thing that we left is this uh, 
predictive distribution for the observations one step ahead and uh, I will remind you when you calculate this explicitly it comes to be a nice integral All right uh, another approximation we can do here is what another approximation is to be the optimal approximation okay um, which uh, hopefully it will appear on a slide all right so let's keep going so these are the two the problems that we need to uh, figure out how to do for our uh, conditional linear Gaussian model the dynamics we know them uh, we need to figure out what proposal to use but in principle uh, the choice is left to you you can do anything you want with this proposal distribution and then uh, we need to calculate this is a complicated thing you need to calculate this distribution here P of Y n given all the previous data up to n minus 1 and all the states up to time n so this is the calculation that's very expensive and this is where we need to use the structure of the conditional Gaussian model uh, uh, in our model so how do we compute this uh, can you give me some ideas basically uh, is this good news the fact that this distribution uh, is conditional on all the axes what does that tell you what type of uh, distribution do you expect this to be for the conditional Gaussian model everything is Gaussian if it is conditioned on all the axes all right, so effectively you should be ready that this distribution should be something that you can derive from the Kalman equ filtering equations anything that is conditioned on x or the axis comes to be Gaussian right so this has to be a byproduct of the, uh, the Kalman filtering equations so uh, let me uh, uh, show you and, and then I will just throw the results okay uh, a calculation why this comes to be a Gaussian so uh, this is what we need to compute so when I do this I'm going to bring Zn minus 1 and Zn in the picture you remember there's our state another state variable Z and I'm going to integrate this uh, Zn minus 1 and Zn uh, from the picture uh, so I'm going to write this Yn conditional on all of this times the probability of Zn, Zn minus 1 conditional or whatever is left which is this correct okay uh, now look at this do we know what this distribution is this is the probability of Yn all right given all my x's given Zn minus 1 and given Zn do I know that You remember our model had two equations and one was the observation equation isn't it this our function z in the observation model right is the probability basically of yn given uh, zn and xn there's no other dependence there all right so this is a nice Gaussian now this involves zn and zn minus one and I can write this as Zn condition on Zn minus 1 and then times the probability of Zn minus 1 times that okay um, now um, what is this what's the probability of Zn given Zn minus 1 and uh, all the other extra things do we have an evolution equation for Zn it was the first equation the dynamic, in the dynamical model so this is my function f basically of Zn given Zn minus 1 there is no dependence uh, Zn depends only on Zn minus 1 okay in, in this particular model so that's my function f and then uh, here what I have is the probability of Zn minus 1 given um, x1n and um, all the data up to n minus n to n minus 1 do I know this distribution? And actually, I, I noticed uh, I, I here. Okay, this is Excel. It doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, obviously 
obviously this uh, n here doesn't um, matter in uh, the condition okay so if you look at the probability of zn minus one given um, uh, y one to n minus one and x one to n minus one uh, what distribution is that what you know it's a gaussian from the carbon filtering and what was the notation that we used uh, to describe this in the generic carbon filtering equations? You remember this is a filtering distribution at step n minus 1. So what was the exact notation we used for the mean and the variance? It was mu with what type of subscripts? n minus 1, n minus 1. And uh, covariance, uh, sigma n minus 1, n minus 1, all right? But the bottom line here is, uh, to compute this, I don't need to keep track of all the previous states from 1 to n minus 1. The only thing that I can keep track is the mean and the covariance matrices in uh, this uh, filtering equation, uh, and only update basically this mean and the covariance as I go from one time step to another. So basically, this mean and the covariance all right, of this predicted of this filtering distribution are the sufficient statistics that I need from all the uh, state information that I have collected. You don't need to keep track of x from 1 to n minus 1. Uh, if you keep track only of the mean and the covariance, you know, that's good enough. And actually, as we know from the camera filtering, when we go to the next time step, we can use this to update to uh, the mu and sigma at the next time step as well. So here is the idea. Uh, okay, so this is how the Kalman, uh, this uh, implementation of um, sequential Monte Carlo will look like for this uh, linear conditional Gaussian model, taking advantage of the fact that conditional X, all the distributions are Gaussian. So look at it and tell me uh, what has changed here? Let's start at, uh, you know, this time n minus 1. What is different here from what uh, we had before in the generic algorithm? What did we see there that is different? I mean, in the generic algorithm, of course, we have, uh, you know, the particles at n minus 1. We have the weights at n minus 1 unless, uh, you know, you uh, resample and this is 1 over n. And instead of this, what did we have before? When we did just general sequential on the color, what did we have there before for each particle? What was there instead of mu and sigma? I don't even know what slide is back. Yeah, there it is. So what was there before? What is that? What is that? We have to keep track basically on the states uh, at all the previous time steps to do these calculations. But for the conditional linear Gaussian model, that is not necessary. The only thing we need to keep track is of the sufficient statistics of the previous states, and the sufficient statistics is the mean and the covariance of that filtering distribution. Yep? Okay? So, uh, similarly, in the proposal distribution, basically, in addition to the current data, right? Uh, you have to keep track of uh, x n minus 1, x from 1 to n minus 1. That, that you don't need that anymore. Uh, you only need uh, the previous particle, basically, because, you know, if you're going to do Monte Carlo, uh, I mean, a Monte Carlo move, you know, you need to have the previous particle. But all the previous uh, uh, histories are substituted, basically, with the mean and the covariance matrices. And um, the weights, basically, the updates also involve mu and sigma. So uh, this is your incremental weight, all right? And uh, there is one bullet item uh, that before you do the sampling, basically, effectively, what you need to do is uh, you, need, you need to use the Kalman filtering equations to update 
mu and sigma from the step n minus 1 to the step n, right? And then you come back and you continue to the next time step, okay? So the fact, bottom line, right, and the rest is uh, sort of equations, okay? The bottom line is because conditioning on this, uh, uh, the history of facts is this is a linear Gaussian model, we can get rid of the dependence of the, on the histories of uh, the states by keeping the sufficient statistics, which is the mean and the covariance of the filtering distribution, and then basically at each step, updating this uh, statistics with uh, the updated questions of the Kalman filtering. And I give you basically explicitly uh, all the equations here. Um, so depending what book you look, you know, sometimes they just write uh, the two variables together as uh, KF, you know, Kalma filtering subscripted at then correspond to particle I, right? You have to do this for each particle I, right? You have to do this for each part particle I. Uh, and um, the update equations basically are what you see here. So if you write a nice program, all right, um, you know, further questions there, you should be able to integrate this with uh, the, um, with sequential Monte Carlo, basically, with no difficulty. All right, so, uh, okay, so we talk, you remember the objective was uh, to calculate uh, this distribution, right? So. Uh, with the previous algorithm, basically, you can come up with a Monte Carlo approximation of this distribution that looks like this. Okay? So these are your particles at uh, time n, and these are the importance weights uh, uh, wn. So suppose now somebody tells you, well, you know what? I don't really care about uh, uh, xn. I want to go back to the original problem. I want to know uh, the filtering distribution of zn given all my data to time n. Because, you know, I, I told you that, let's say, practically X can be a discrete variable that defines what sort of dynamical model you use, right? And the actual state, let's say the location of a missile, uh, may be uh, the Z variable. So you'd be interested to know uh, what is the, pro the filtering distribution of Zn given Y from 1 to N. How do we compute that uh, based on the, the algorithm that we had before? Uh, so let's uh, do the calculation. I plug in an x there, 1 to n, and then I integrate all the x's out. I write this as zn given uh, x and y from 1 to n times the probability of uh, x from 1 to n times y 1 to n. This probability I already computed in terms of the weights and the particles. So here's the final answer. It comes. When you put the Monte Carlo approximation here, what you get is you get the weights for all the particles times the uh, probability of Zn given Xn and all the beta. What distribution is this? You remember if I know the states, right? If I know the states, this is a Gaussian. And uh, actually, what was the notation on on, uh, um, on our generic uh, Kalman filtering equations? What was the notation uh, for the mean and the covariance for this type of distribution? For the mean, what did we say? It was mu with subscripts what? Nn, okay? And sigma Nn. So basically, um, th this filtering distribution comes to be a weighted uh, average of Gaussians, uh, each of them uh, with uh, uh, mean and covariance calculated from the Kalman filtering. So you notice here, to be able to implement this algorithm, we have to run uh, n Kalman filter, um, uh, you know, approximations, one for each, no, actually they are not approximations, they are exact, right? One for each particle uh, i from i 1 to n, okay? So, if you compute this, everything is available to you. So, uh, this is a Gaussian mixture. So, if you are interested in uh, the mean, so if you want to plot, let's say, the mean path of a missile, uh, uh, you have W times the mean. So, if you want the covariance, uh, you use basically uh, this uh, simple formula on the bottom. 
and um, and uh, you can do anything else you're interested basically on this type of things. Okay, um, I'm not going to tell you actually the rest. So I, I basically I am giving you some uh, uh, examples where the state axis uh, discrete, right? That comes a lot in uh, navigation problems and things like that. Um, and the equations are actually simplified, but you know, you basically read the notes. Okay, so, um, uh, and something I did not mention is that uh, you can guess that you can design uh, proposal distributions, including optimal proposal distributions, but we don't need to keep track of uh, the whole particle history, but only xn minus 1 and this uh, karma filtering uh, sufficient statistics uh, at the previous time step. All right, so you don't need to keep all the particles, uh, just the updates uh, of the statistics that you keep track from one step to another. Okay, so one of these, uh, there's, there's examples actually in the notes and, um, and it comes out, you know, this is, uh, I don't remember if it is from, uh, um, maybe from a loose book or something or a reference. It comes out that uh, for very specific cases, uh, even the Kalman filtering equations and uh, all the updates, they take a closed form analytical solution. So for certain problems, uh, this is the problem, for example, that I consider here. Uh, so the Z state looks like that. The X dependency is only on this term B. And uh, I make x to be a discrete variable. Can take the values one or two with uh, probabilities 0 0.7 and 0 0.3. And uh, so b at one is 0.5, b at uh, two is uh, 1.5. But anyways, it comes out that when you take all the previous equations for this problem, you can write all the equations actually analytically. Okay. So the uh, if you really want to sort of convince yourself that uh, these things make sense, try to derive these equations. It doesn't take a lot of effort, and it's wonderful that actually you can compute the sufficient statistics analytically, okay, and in closed form because the variables here are very sc are scalar, okay. So, um, and at the end of the day, you know what? Uh, this is uh, uh, again. I give you a little code there that uh, you may want to. Uh, modify, uh, but you know, so this is a problem with uh, 300 steps, 500 particles, and we estimate the state Zn, okay, and uh, these uh, circles are the exact uh, states, I mean this is how I generated the data basically, I gave the states and then from there I computed uh, Y and then I went backwards from Y to recalculate the stage with sequence of Monte Carlo. And you can see it's not perfect, but it's, uh, you know, considering that uh, uh, there is a lot of variability, this is pretty good. Okay? So the calculations uh, are uh, pretty good. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is uh, 424. Uh, I need to go back to some things that uh, we did not manage to cover on the uh, on the lecture on uh, on Monday, okay? So one of the things is that I want to tell you is, uh, a little bit uh, about uh, smoothing. Um, so. Um, the objective, the way that we stated uh, the generic, um, uh, the generic problem in uh, in sequential Monte Carlo was to calculate the probability of all the states given all the data at each step, right? But as we demonstrated in the first lecture on sequential Monte Carlo, when you do this calculation because of this uh, degeneracy issue, uh, the let's say at time n. You should not trust basically the approximation for the first step, second, third, fourth step in early times, right? It doesn't look very good. Because at the end of the day, lots of the particles have collapsed to one particle. So the Monte Carlo approximation 
uh, for uh, let's say for xj for j is less than uh, significantly less than n is not very good okay so one of the things you can do is uh, if you want to improve the approximation of uh, xk given all the data is to compute this uh, uh, this probability which is uh, you can appreciate why it is called a smoothing distri distribution. Right? Can you get some sense why this we call it a smoothing distribution? To calculate the state at k, at time k, we don't only use the data up to time k, but we use all the data, even future data. So we basically regularize the solution by bringing information as to uh, the dynamics of the system past step k. So obviously, they're not going to be doing this online, right? They're not going to be collecting data and say, give me the future data so I can do an estimation now. So you're not going to manipulate a satellite or something like that like this. But if you have all the data and you're in your office and you say, can I find the best estimate of the state K given all my data, then a reasonable thing to do is to compute this uh, distribution that's called a smoothing distribution. So uh, this moving distribution, basically, it is a subset of the more general problem that we address, uh, which is computing this, OK? And uh, so you can write this distribution exactly using just the decomposition, the product rule, as uh, uh, appreciate what is happening here, because I'm going backwards. The probability of XN given all the data and we said that this comes very good when we do sequential Monte Carlo. Because at every time step, right, we can compute the state well, very well. Okay? And then I have this product of probabilities of computing the state K using all the data and the previous states from, I'm sorry, and the future states from K plus 1 to N. So effectively, in doing this decomposition, you know what? I'm going backwards. I say I can do this calculation correctly, and now if I can compute this smoothing distribution somehow differently, this approximation will be way better than what we have done up to now. Everybody understands why this is different, right? We use all the data to compute xk, uh, where k is significantly less than, one, than n. So let's say n is a thousand, and I compute x5 given all the data from one to a thousand. So to compute, so this obviously is going to come to be way more accurate if I use the probability of xk using, let's say, uh, uh, data from uh, one to uh, not to k, but let's say uh, one to some smaller number than n. Okay. We use future data, we smooth the results, right? This is the effect of regularization that makes this calculation uh, uh, less noisy than if we don't use all the data. So the idea of this smoothing approximation is to decompose this equation, this joint probability of all the x's given all the y's, backwards, okay? So we trust that this comes correctly, and then all of these products that you see here, all right? They are smoothing distributions because they are at states less than n, but they use all the data. So the question is, uh, so the, this equation is exact, right? And we go backwards, okay? Uh, so actually to implement this, I can tell you, you will need to go and do all the filtering equations. You need to go and predict basically the, uh, uh, you know, all the updates when we did sequential Monte Carlo, let's say Carlo filtering up to step n. And then when you reach step n, you start going backwards, OK? So you will, of course, know this at step n. And then we have to calculate those distributions. So let's see. How do we compute this probability? Um, so I claim here that this probability of xk, given all of these nice things, is equal to this. And I want you to tell me why. It says they are using the Markov property. So look at this and give me your intuition why this is really equal to that. Somehow, why did I, you know, so I said, I don't need to know all the states. I need to know only xk plus 1. And I don't need to know all the data. I only need to know from 1 to k. So what's that?
if I know the state at k plus 1, what can I do with that information? If you show the form of the questions, right? If you know the state at k plus 1, what can you do? Anything. You can compute anything uh, ahead of you. So basically, this data from k plus y, k plus 1 to n, are all functions of xk plus 1. If I know xk plus 1, that's a sufficient information to move forward. Okay? And uh, similarly, if you know the state at k plus 1, I don't need to know the state at k plus 2 and k plus 3, because k plus 1, through the dynamical model, defines all the states. Okay? So this, using the Markov properties, is equal to that. Okay? I am writing this uh, with Bayes rule uh, this way. And uh, forget the denominator for now. All right? So this is proportional to uh, the probability of xk plus 1 given xk, which is my dynamic uh, uh, equation, times the probability of xk given y1 to k. So to compute each of these terms, what do I need to know? Does this distribution sound familiar to you? What is this distribution? What is the distribution P of xk given y1 to k? Remember when we're doing sequential Monte Carlo, we're computing, you know, our joint distribution at all steps, at step 1, 2, 3, etc. So what is this? We gave it a name also. What's the probability of xk given, you know, if you don't like it, how about the probability of x1 to k given y1 to k? How do we compute? Do we compute it already this, move it forward? Well, we, we said we will do all the calculations, uh, do all the filtering uh, uh, calculations from time 1 to time n. So this uh, calculation, have we done this somewhere? When did we do this calculation? At step k. So basically, to compute this, we just need for dynamical equation, uh, this f times this filtering uh, distribution of step k, all right, and everything else is done. Okay. So uh, so basically, if you use this and you plug in all of this there, going backwards from step n, uh, you can um, uh, come up with uh, a smoothing approximation, which actually will give you superior results to sequential Monte Carlo the way we have seen it, because now you use future data to estimate uh, uh, the states at each time given all the data. This is very important, given all the data. Okay? So, um, all right, so uh, let me shift the, the, the uh, okay, so um, maybe I need to go back to explain this for a second. Uh, so this is, in, in our calculation, we have to calculate this smoothing distributions. There was the product of F and the filtering distribution. So the filtering distribution, with, uh, when we were doing further calculations, we had uh, a Monte Carlo approximation to it. This is the Monte Carlo approximation to it. So if you have a Monte Carlo approximation of it, what is the Monte Carlo approximation of this smoothing distribution? It is nothing else. But this weights of uh, the filtering distribution times f with the particles of k uh, being the particles that you have calculated from the filtering distribution. Okay? So basically, plug in a Monte Carlo approximation for the filtering distribution, and then what you have is you have uh, a Monte Carlo approximation for this distribution. Okay? So uh, this. You calculate it in the forward uh, uh, equations, right? This comes in the backwards moving equations, and uh, that completes basically the circle. And this is the algorithm basically of going backwards, okay? So you start with the Monte Carlo approximation of the filtering equation step n, and then you start going backwards to n minus 1 up to time n. You compute this new um, uh, weights, okay? Uh, and eventually, when you keep doing this, you basically have a sample from the smoothing distribution of x1 to n given y1 to n. And you may say, but 
Then we compute this with, uh, before this we computed, but the way we computed it is by moving forwards. Now we compute it differently by going backwards after we went forwards. So the approximation is way smoother, uh, nicer than the approximations when you do a forward type of uh, calculation. Okay? And of course, because this is a sampling based uh, type of calculations, right? You can repeat this procedure and if you want you can average, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I mean when you take samples, right? Maybe next time you, you, you do the calculation you have different set of samples, uh, so you, you have the opportunity to actually uh, smooth the results uh, even further uh, that way. This uh, offline basically, right? You cannot do this uh, in real time. Uh, smoothing calculations are extremely important in many areas of uh, scientific and engineering applications. So, uh, if you search, you know, on this broad area of uh, data simulation techniques, these are the type of things that people are doing. Okay? So, in uh, meteorological applications, weather prediction, you know, dynamical systems, robotics, uh, uh, just mention it, okay? These are the types of things. And don't expect, again, for something to come and scream and say this is a dynamical system moving, you make it to look like a dynamical system, okay? Uh, and sometimes, uh, like when we work with static problems, if something doesn't look dynamical because it's a static problem, you can still use this type of ideas uh, if you allow your, uh, uh, you know, your imagination to run crazy. Howdy, we have a new visitor coming in class. Uh, all right, so here are some results. Uh, this is actually, we have seen this problem before. Um, this is the evolution of the state. This is the observation equation. So this is the true state. It's given like that. Uh, this is the observation. So this is the data that you use. So basically what you need to do is run forward calculations uh, and use this wise to find the field of distribution of Xn given date up to its time as you move forward. When you're done, go backwards and find the, the uh, um, smoothing distribution of Xn given all this data, right, all this data. So uh, this is the smoothing trajectories from 1 to 100. You'll be actually surprised when you do this in your homework. I don't know if I ask you to do this, but you'll be surprised uh, how smooth the data come to be inaccurate. Okay, so um, again, you cannot do this in real time tracking, but you know, if offline, if you have all the data available, this is the way to do the calculations. Uh, and of course, you can even post, so uh, if you want the distribution of a few states, let's say it's states are steps three and four, given all the data, right, you can actually do eventually, uh, because you have a particle approximation of this, you can. Uh, 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 you know, do uh, uh, a density estimation for your particles. You can uh, uh, ask MATLAB to plot the density. You can uh, get uh, all sorts of densities. So the original reference that uh, uh, has all the fundamentals about um, uh, smoothing is this paper by Gladstill and Doucet. Uh, and uh, so there is a link there if you guys are interested to, to, to read. Okay, 439, so I need I'm not going to tell you the problem, okay? So here's the problem. I'm going to tell you the problem and you read it if it comes to be relevant to uh, your research, okay? So uh, this is our dynamical equations as we had before, and these are the observation equations. So I want to consider the case where, um, in addition to estimating from the data y the state x, I also want to estimate some parameters that come in the model. And those parameters are static, they don't evolve with time. So let's say, you know, you uh, do not know the dynamics well, so you fit them in some model, and it has some parameters. Let's say maybe you say it's a Gaussian, I have no idea what the mean is, I don't know what the variance is, or something else, or there's some noise and you don't know what the noise is. This is theta. How do you estimate both theta and the state at the same time. One parameter is static, never changes, the other ones evolve with time. So someone will say, well, I'm going to form a joint uh, 
instead of just updating the states at this time step n, I'm going to update the parameters n the states x from 1 to n, all right? And you can do this, and someone even can say, I can make my parameters theta to look dynamic by enhancing my dynamical model to involve this delta function that says the theta parameters don't change. I can do that. It will not work. Okay? Uh, if you try to estimate static parameters uh, with any sort of ideas of sequential Monte Carlo and, and dynamic variable sex simultaneously, you're going to have a hard time uh, to make this parameter structure give you the right values. Okay? So don't try to simultaneously calibrate parameters of a model and at the same time calculate the state. So what you need to do is you need to force these parameters to move. You know, not to be stationary. Keep moving. So, you know, the very early idea was, you know what? What happened? Come on. Uh, all right. So the original idea, you know what it was? How about if we make these parameters, even though they are sort of static, to have some dynamics? So basically, people started introducing some noise, and they said theta k equal to theta k minus 1 plus epsilon k. So this basically tells you uh, you can um, update them, but in a way that, you know, somehow this update has to be a smart one, but uh, you don't, you know, I mean, this parameter is supposed to be the same, so you need to sort of move around uh, possibly the posterior of theta given all the data that you're having a problem, right? The posterior of theta given, uh, that should be your target distribution given the data y. Uh, so, um, let me see if I actually, um, uh, since we don't have time, I am going to tell you what uh, you need to know. So here's the idea. We are going to use Metropolis Hastings algorithm. By the way, uh, uh, Jesus told me when he was collecting the homework that some of you do not seem to bother to read about uh, Metropolis Hastings. You were making your own algorithm and you call it M8, you know, without actually bothering to read what Metropolis Hastings was about. So please go back and read it because it's very, very fundamental to this course, okay? So in the Metropolis Hastings, we need a proposal distribution and uh, our target is this joint of theta and x, all right? And we're going to start making moves in theta the same way we make moves in the state. And uh, a proposal distribution that I'm using here is uh, some proposal distribution on theta, and of course a proposal distribution on uh, x, all right, conditional theta, okay? Uh, so you can think, you know, you make a move uh, in, uh, um, in uh, theta, uh, and for the new theta, then you make a move in x, okay? And the accepted probability basically is given uh, by uh, Metropolis Hastings from what you see here. Uh, here I used actually as a proposal distribution for moving the state, the exact uh, uh, distribution, this conditional of x given y for a given theta. Uh, there is a lot of information there, but key message, uh, if you want to, um, to do this optimization, you know, uh, don't rely on, on uh, on uh, mixing different techniques, you have to do some moves on theta, and uh, Metropolis case things or deep sampling, simultaneously updating theta and x are the ways to go. Um, the algorithm actually looks extremely uh, simple on using particle approximations, and it is this slide that you see here. Uh, effectively, what you need to do is uh, update theta, you run sequence on the counter for a given theta all the way up to the end of this, you know, the calculations. You compute this uh, marginal of the data and this theta in distribution of uh, x given all the y's for that specific theta. Uh, and uh, once you're done, then for that theta you sample, uh, you take a sample of your states, you compute the acceptance probability, and uh, if you accept, you update both theta and um, the state, if not, uh, you keep iterating basically, okay? So this is sort of an elementary way. The other way that you can do this problem is 
uh, if you can compute theta that maximizes the marginal likelihood. And I give you this on the homework set, by the way, and I ask you to, to compute the parameters theta that ma maximize the marginal likelihood. But rather than asking you to do the calculation uh, with, uh, you know, real maximization, I said, how about if you compute this from, let's say, the uh, sequence of the Carlo using different values of theta and see w what values of theta maximize this log uh, uh, marginal likelihood, OK? Uh, and I'm going to finish uh, it's 446. Uh, the best way to do this is using uh, Robbins Monroe. Okay? You remember stochastic optimization? So you can compute these parameters with Robbins Monroe. But to do that, uh, you need to compute um, the gradient uh, of um, this distribution here with respect to the parameters. And uh, uh, to carry on this calculation, you have to know a little bit about probability measure theory because the weights in the 